so today talking about um, lessons from industrial and interaction design. So I assume you're all aware this is the last lecture uh, of the year. So I'm sure you're all ready for finals next week already. Yeah, good. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll jump right in. I'm gonna try and wrap this up a, uh, as quick as I can. And then I want to talk with you guys a little bit before you go about um, sort of the EPICS lectures, how they've gone, and some of the future states we're looking at and get some feedback. So I'm gonna hold you all captive as a, as a bit of a um, focus group at the end of this. Um, but hopefully that'll be all right. So um, we'll go ahead and jump in. So first, what is industrial design? Is anybody familiar with industrial design? Any design students in here? Okay, we, one? Okay, you, get, oh, you guys both are. So you wanna give a, so what are you doing? <laughs> uh, you wanna give a definition of industrial design without reading? Right, so those of you guys who couldn't hear that, I said more of sort of the aesthetics, feel, and sort of how a user would interact with a project. And so um, industrial designers mostly work on physical things. So uh, for instance, the shape of my clicker here, right? So having an ergonomic shape fits in your hand, is intuitive to use, those kind of things. And so they often come from an art background, right? So you, a lot of times, um, and including here, it's hosted in the art school. There are a lot of dedicated industrial design schools as well. And so when you get out into industry, people will talk about product designers, and they're usually talking about this type of a, of a person who has more of an art background, okay? And then you guys will think about product engineers, those of you who are, who are engineering students, or development engineers as the kind of people who take a, an idea and they build it into a physical thing, right? Or into a project. So these are closely related and very um, compatible ideas. And of all the things that I really wish that I had learned or taken a class on when I was in school to the work that I did in industry was wishing I had learned more about industrial design, okay? So something that comes into everything you do. So um, industrial designers, uh, this is from the Industrial Designer Society of America, create products and systems that optimize um, function, value, and appearance for the mutual benefit of the user and manufacturer. So both sides of the coin, how does the user use it and how do we make it cost effective and easy to manufacture, things like that, okay? So in my own experience, I, I worked with an industrial design firm um, at, at Biomet when I worked there as, as an engineer and I learned a tremendous amount working with them. So there, there's a whole world there to learn that you don't get in engineering school. All right, so that's just a little kind of quick uh, blurb on what industrial engineering is. So, um, well, um, anybody pull anything out of that that other than what we talked about? So, you know, we talked a lot about, it's about you and me, so it's a lot about human-centered, right? And so in Epics, we teach human-centered design. So we try and push you toward thinking about these things but we can't necessarily within the scope of epics teach you how to actually implement some of those more art related or feel things, okay? So interaction design is a very similar idea but aimed more at software, okay? So we have a good interaction design program here at Purdue. In fact, a lot of those students do a partnership with us and get on our teams and help us rethink how we're doing software. So interaction design, um, 
according to IDEO, is the equivalent of industrial design but in software rather than in physical objects. And like industrial design, the discipline starts from the needs and desires of the people who use a product or service and strive to create designs that would give aesthetic pleasure and lasting satisfaction and enjoyment. So this sounds a lot like what we preach up here about human-centered design, right? Does it sound pretty close, right? So when we send you guys out to your community partners, we say you need to build empathy, come to some understanding of what they need and how they need it, come up with what your user needs would be in a holistic sense, looking at all of the stakeholders. Um, so a very similar thing to what we talk about, but this is really a software-focused piece, and we'll talk about some examples uh, of, of things that were designed by engineers. So I, I, about 80% of Epic students are engineering students. So most of you in this room are engineering students. So uh, these instruments up here at the top, these are instruments for um, preparing the tibia of a, of a knee replacement. Okay, so this is what I did when I was an, a real engineer. Okay, so I made instruments like this and the implants that went along with them. And these were the ones from my company up here on the top left. So they were very industrial. They were very matter of fact, here's what you need to do to have the job. There's a little bit of detail on the handle um, that would imply that's where fingers go, but you notice they're evenly spaced, your fingers aren't. So um, that was a, an attempt, but not a very elegant one. Um, and then you can look down here. So this set of instruments um, at the time that this one was designed were at least 10 years old, so, so behind the scale. These down here were from a competitor, uh, competing company, and you can see the detail in the handle, some of the over molding. Uh, and some of the shapes, so they're kind of aesthetically pleasing, and they key into what you're supposed to do. So you can tell uh, this one you're supposed to twist, right? And you can kind of indicate that by the very shape of it. So you don't need instructions to tell you what to do to understand how to use the tool. So you can get some idea of how you can go from an engineered solution, something that um, works really well, and you can get on toward a well-designed solution, so something that's much more aesthetic something that you would want to buy or use, right? So surgeons use these ones on the top and they work just fine. Surgeons want to use ones more like these down here. And so uh, it, since, the, since I made these slides, I think every company in the field has gone to something more like this. Uh, unfortunately for this company, in my humble opinion, these instruments didn't work really well, but they looked nice and they felt really good. Um, so there is always that piece too. So the, the designers who created these may or may not have had any idea uh, how to actually build them, that's not necessarily the role, that's often the engineer's role. But it's learning how to work in that team to say, how do we get both the function and um, the underlying technology together in the same place. So here's another great example. So this is an older programmable thermostat up on the top left. I'm sorry, my laser's not working real well. Um, so this is a like, classic engineered solution, right? You got a bunch of gray buttons on a gray background, um, and it works. Uh, completely, you know, it does the job and functionally it works. But there wasn't much thought into how the user interacts with this, okay? And then if we moved into something more modern like the Nest thermostat, this started with designers, not with engineers, okay? So it started with how does a person interact with this? How do you work with it? What does it need to do in the functions? And all of the technical details of how it executed that were secondary, okay? So they started with the user and moved to the technology instead of starting with the technology and then trying to you know, fit the user in there. Does that make sense to everybody? Those, those kind of different approaches. So as engineers, we love technology and a lot of us want to jump in and just go into the technical solution, but we end up trying to backtrack into making it usable instead of thinking, how does this work? How are people interact with it? And then moving into the technology, okay? Um, so looking at another classic example, so the engineers at Nintendo that put together the first Nintendo had a rectangle pad, right? There's nothing ergonomic about that rectangle. It was fun. You guys probably weren't born when I was playing this. Uh, but then as you move into more modern controls, you see they become sleek and aesthetic, right? They become ergonomic and fit your hand, right? So you can play it for 12 hours at night instead of working on your project without your wrist fatiguing, that sort of thing. Uh, so moving into software, I'm going to show you some of these. Uh, so I'm going to look at some websites in particular because it's easy software to show. Uh, so this is the, the United States Supreme Court, okay? So if you look through this website, there's a calendar that shows you argument and non-argument days. Uh, very fancy. Um, you can see some of the recent decisions, and then there are some arguments and transcripts, okay, through here. But if you wanted to go and search for something, you can... Uh, put it up here, um, so let's say uh, 
Roe v. Wade, because that's one that most of us have heard of. Um, you get this nice big list of stuff, and it's not NASA versus Nelson, right? This is not a very usable site, okay? Not super friendly. So an, an interaction design student isn't going to produce something like this. Now, if we go and look at another, so this is a government website, okay, in the United States. Here's another government website. This is the Gene Lab from NASA. So you can see right away there is a lot uh, more aesthetically appealing. You've got a consistent menu across the side. And you can get some really quick information, and it's interactive, okay? So everything kind of moves as you go. And it's pretty easy to follow along. So you can get kind of the difference of one that's started from a usability perspective and one that started from a really functional perspective. Um, so we can uh, move, a so you move along to the next bit of this. So compare, um, uh, we'll compare a couple of sort of online marketplaces. So I love DigiKey, they're a great partner of ours, um, but I have a really hard time using this website. I think it's very difficult to use. So the main page doesn't look too bad, but um, so part of this problem comes from handling a huge amount of product, right? So they're trying to sell you a lot of different things. But if you look up, say, uh, mail headers, uh, for those of you who are electrical engineers, well, my search bar isn't even working. It's usually better than this, I promise that. Uh, so then you get this uh, set of results of categories. And so, well, I probably want uh, one in the biggest category. Well, this one has 117,000 items, and this one has 61,000, this one has 37,000. I have no idea which one of these I need to go to get to to get to the part that I need, right? So it's very difficult to use uh, because of the huge amount of, of information. Now, the, the plus side is you can get the exact specific thing you need for any application of electronics, but it's difficult to use. And if you contrast that with something like Amazon.com, right? You can put in the same search, and you have mail headers, and this is probably the one that I was looking for right off the bat, and it's the very first one, okay? I can see a picture, that's what I buy at a supplier lab. Uh, so even if I don't order it from here, that's the part that I'm looking for. So you get kind of the idea of one of these was driven from kind of engineering practicality, and one of them was driven from um, a more human-centered approach, looking at how people would interact with it. So the last one that I, uh, has improved since I created these slides um, was the old Epics website. It's still not great, but it's better than it used to be. Uh, so the old website looked like this, and content was really difficult to find. Um, we've improved a little bit, but there's still plenty of work to be done. I think most of you are pretty familiar with this site. Um, but again, even having the, you know, this many links right here is difficult to sort through. So students have no idea that there's a project delivery tab here. So I've had a couple of teams delivering and they didn't know that this existed. And I've got the things they really need hidden at the bottom, right? So I'm not an interaction designer. And also I'm stuck with the template that we have. So I didn't get to design that from scratch. Um, if you compare that with uh, another university website, this is University of Nebraska Lincoln. So it's engaging as soon as you look at it. You have pretty clear menus that are easy to follow. Um, and you can get through some additional information, but it's bright and visually appealing right off the bat, okay? Does everybody get kind of the difference and all these, these kind of uh, disconnects between uh, things that were designed for technology and things that were designed for people, okay? That's really the dichotomy that gets you in trouble. When you are technology first, then you tend to run yourself out of good solutions for people. Uh, so, oh, my presentation back. Um, so one way um, to kind of start to work through these ideas is instead of going through and getting into the classic cycle of building this fully functional prototype and getting stuck, is to do some quicker turnover um, design. So one way to do that is through a concept study. So the basic idea in a concept study is you take the general idea of what it is that you're designing for and you try and just pen and paper come up with as many different variations as you can so you can start to look through what are the pros and cons of the different variations. And the solution you end up with may be some combination of them, but um, so this example is, is a headphone, obviously. Um, so looking at here's some of the different shapes that this could take, some of the different functions it might have, 
and then converging on something that, that would work well. So just for a few minutes, we'll do an exercise. So what I want you to do is just get out a pencil or pen and paper and draw at least 10 versions of a kitchen spatula. So I know cooking skills in here probably vary a lot from none to a lot, uh, but you've all used a spatula, flip something in a pan. Uh, so just take a few minutes, we'll draw 10. That's very clever. Anybody else? No? Okay, so we can have holes or no holes depending on how you. Very nice, okay. Oh, I can see that. Might be hard to clean, but yeah, it's a good idea. Anybody else want to share? Okay, those are good. So do you, did you kind of see how by working through um, just some quick sketches, you could kind of look at different you know, versions of the same thing and look at how small changes might affect your, your outcome. And it's a lot faster than going through and building a prototype and then trying it and finding out that you wanted sloped edges after the fact, right? Um, so uh, moving on, uh, another version of this, <coughs> same kind of idea is low fidelity prototyping. So I think we've talked about this a little bit in past lectures, uh, but this is a really great way for you to start to think through how someone would interact with your product, okay? So when you're at the very beginning stages of your project and you first come through that kind of uh, ideation phase and you're coming up with a whole bunch of new ideas for how you could do you know, something, how you could solve this problem. Uh, a lot of the times what we do is we pick one idea, we fixate on it, and we build it for a full semester at least, right, Work it, working through. Uh, and then when you get done, you realize, I wish that I had done something different, right? I wish instead of this, um, so a project I was working on today, they had torque hinges, and in the end they wish they had had mechanical stops, right? And if they had built a simple prototype before they had gotten through working through all of the detailed design, they may have come to that conclusion much sooner. So low fidelity prototypes simply just mean a, a quick and dirty version of whatever it is that you're doing. It can be really rough. It could be pieces of cardboard and tape. Right? You could go through and just build something physical. And you can do the same basic thing with software. So you can look at um, what would the layout be? How would someone interact with this? So you could draw all of the different screens of a website or a piece of software out and have somebody sit down with it and say, I would touch this button and I would touch this button and walk you through how someone, a person, would interact with it. So you can start to get at, is this intuitive to use, right? Can I just hand this to you and you know what to do with it or do you need a lot of instructions? Because we all want to aim toward intuitive design, right? Especially with all the language barriers that we have today uh, in the world, as the world's gotten smaller, it's much easier if people can intuit how to use your device, okay? Um, and so it also helps you get uh, some of the feedback that's not focused on execution. So going from a design, and we talked about this a little bit with craftsmanship, going from an idea to a final product takes a whole lot of craftsmanship, okay? And so when you get to that end product, you're being judged on both the idea and the execution of the idea, right? So I had this idea for a car, I built the car, it doesn't match what my original idea was, right? Because there's, there's always some change in between. And to say, okay, judge this, I'm judging both how you did it and what it was supposed to be, right? So both the execution and the concept. By getting into this, this very early, rapid, low fidelity prototyping, you can put all of the execution aside and say, is this idea work, okay? Does this on a, on just on a basic elemental scale work? Um, and then you can get all of that execution stuff kind of moved out of the way. Um, so again, going back into my history doing um, orthopedic instrument design, we would go through and manufacture the instruments, bring them to surgeons, and we'd have a group of surgeons in that we were paying a lot of money to evaluate instruments, and all they would do is fixate on something that didn't work in the execution, right? So when we went to build it, something was off, and it didn't work, and so they'd say, this doesn't work, I hate it. And you're like, well, wait, look at the concept. Does this concept work? And it's really hard for people to disengage from the physical thing they have in front of them, right? where if you brought them the thing at a really early stage made of clay or paper or cardboard, 
they know obviously this isn't the end solution, right? This isn't what you're getting at, but this is the concept and does this concept work for me, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So being able to get there. Um, so it could be something really simple. I'll show you a little video of um, kind of how this could work. So this is sort of an ATM machine. So they're using a piece of paper um, and they have the different menus just on, on sheets of paper. So you can go up, you can press the buttons, you can put your card in, find out does this make sense to someone to use, okay? So you can see how in five minutes you could build something like this to test out a concept without having to go through programming this machine, building all of the electronics that would go inside this and the physical enclosure. You could spend a year doing all of that work and they're getting that feedback in seconds, right? So wait, <laughs> I like the loading. So transfer of success. And printing receipt. Does everybody get kind of the idea here? So, you know, really simple solution to get you to where you're going. So as you go and have those early meetings with, um, with your project partner, and so you guys are, you know, finishing up for this semester, but as you take this forward into projects that you do, think about the frustrations you had as you went through building something and maybe missed the mark on what exactly it was that you were aiming at. You didn't find out until later on. Um, sorry, that's distracting. Um, so think about how you missed the mark a little bit on what you did and how you could have gotten there sooner and then spent all that time building something that was more in line with what their needs were, okay? So we all go in the beginning, we try and figure out what are those user needs from my, from my project partner and we're gonna miss just a little bit. There's, you're always gonna miss some information. And so working with a prototype can help you figure it out sooner. Um, so we're going to do another exercise quickly. Um, so you've been hired to create an app that helps students browse and search all of the dining options on campus. Okay? The dining halls, eating in your fraternity house, going out to restaurants on campus. Okay? So any of those options. And what I want you to do is pick a partner, so teams of two, and one of you be the de designer and one be the user and just interview the other person on what their needs would be in a dining app. Okay? So go ahead and partner up. I'm just going to give you just a few minutes to do this. So um, go ahead and start in. You at least got a couple. So what we're going to do now um, is to go ahead and create. You can work together on this. Create a prototype with just pen and paper, pencil and paper. Okay. So you create a prototype of your app. Try and show all the screens the user would go through. What do the menus look like? How do you interact with this? What kind of information? So give like a sample restaurant or something. Okay. Um, so it'll be just a couple of minutes to do this, so work fast. Okay, who's got the best, uh, who's got the best app? Who's confident? Who's feeling good? All right. You come, no, come, come on up. Everybody just got really quiet. It's intense. It better be good. You can. Oh. No, right here. Oh, oh. You're ready. Oh, jeez. I've done this before. Oh. This is harder than it looks. You just put it on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to attack the keyboard. You just set it up there. Okay. Well, first, food. Lisa, Lisa's hungry and she wants food. She I took her phone and pushed the food app. Now the app asks her, what do you want to eat? Breakfast, lunch. She wants brunch, she presses brunch. It uses the location services on her phone, says Lisa's right here. Here are some places that are nearby that have brunch, and here are the menus. Lisa, you pick your favorite place. Yeah, All right, cool. All right, so now here's the menu, and she's looking like, uh, I want pizza. So she presses the pizza button, and now she's brought to a menu where she can order, or she can walk there, which then can show her a button to either order or the direction she goes. Lisa is lazy, Excellent. Very good. 
Hopefully it's a breakfast pizza or something. Oh, no, I like pizza a lot. <laughs> you just like, is it, you go cold pizza in the morning or? Cold pizza is a classic breakfast food, oh. traditionally. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm with you. Um, okay. So we we did that. Good. Um, so that's that's going to be all for lectures. So if you are <coughs> interested in learning more, um, in the art and design school here, there are several classes on um, on drawing materials, industrial design interaction design. Um, so I recommend you look into those. You'll find that they fill out a lot of your portfolio uh, uh, in a significant way if you're an engineering student. If you're a design student, you, you know about this already. So that's all, for, that's all for lecture. So I'm going to just hold you tight for a few more minutes just to talk about um, a little bit about um, lectures. So I guess, first of all, you've all been at least one lecture in epics. Um, being here today. Um, I, most of you, or all of you probably have gone through the five introductory lectures, and a lot of you are familiar faces, so I know you've been in here before. So one of the problems that we're having is that Epix is growing very quickly, and um, being able to have everyone in a room like this gets to be really challenging. And what I don't want to see necessarily are 300 people lecture halls. So um, like the first few lectures, we're in very big rooms in physics, um, and it can be very disengaging. We're trying to be more hands-on. Um, but we've also looked at maybe moving things online. Um, so I guess um, just informally, um, to get me to stop um, doing a, a monologue, do, do any of you have strong opinions on um, being in person versus online learning? Um, I feel like being in person makes it easier to want to remember to go. And if I know whenever I used to have like the opportunity to watch something online, there was often the chance that I'll forget or just Push it off till the last class or something. Okay. Any other? Yeah, I mean, probably not the opportunity to actually watch it online because I feel like you're uh, embracing it. True. Okay. I don't get a lot of uh, questions in here, but. Now, I know I have some selection bias in this group because you're all physically here instead of doing this online. So I'm, I'm assuming you're the group that likes in person. Have any of you had really good experiences with online learning, e-learning? No? Easier to get distracted. Okay, easier to get distracted? Um, I've taken like a couple of online courses back when I was in high school about like coding and stuff. I think it can be like a difference between what you're trying to teach, what does it lend itself to being taught online, or does it lend itself to being taught in person? Um, and I think that a lot of times it comes down to each student, like are they a online learner or are they an in-person learner? So I, I think that it's best to like keep both options open, but make it optional to go be able to go to lecture if you want to get like free time to do something like that, or sign up for distance learning if you prefer a distance learning kind of approach. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a possibility. So you feel like during lecture, like absolutely like engage though, especially with something you've done, like you don't have a lot of spots right. you can use your time. It might have been like a room you are in. Okay. Like for the actual. Yeah. Most of you are awake most of the time. So what, what if, so things are online. What about methods? Like, do you prefer short videos? Do you prefer like interactivity? Um, like, what what kind of things have worked well? Online, you get you you have um, one single lecture, and then you do that in class like the week. You can't really do it 
Right. Yeah. So if we if we went to online, it wouldn't be just recording.